I'll just kick things off here. Uh, first off, thank you all so much for joining us during your, uh, I think for most folks here Tuesday, and especially for folks in the U.S. the first day after a long weekend. I feel like I've never forgotten of those days, so thank you extra for joining. A um, couple of logistics items before we dive in. Uh, the video, along with all the code that we go through, will be sent out to you afterwards, so you know, be on the lookout for that. And as always, we would love for you to ask questions in the chat um, for us to answer. We'll get to as many of them during the presentation as we can, uh, but if we don't get to your question, we'll try to answer it afterwards. Of course, you can always email us your question in case uh, you know, we do need some more help. Um, so this week, kind of after the Airflow Summit, uh, which was awesome last week, I don't think I got to watch even half the talks, but they should be out soon. Uh, we figured it'd be nice to kind of roll things back a bit and do our standard intro to Airflow webinar. Uh, we try to do one of these just about once a quarter, just to make sure for new users, we are giving you content that is helpful. Um, so, you know, without further ado, Kenton, would you please introduce yourself and get things kicked off here? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Faraj. Uh, hi, everybody. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Kenton Danis. I'm a lead developer advocate at Astronomer. I'm super excited to be here. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about in an introduction to Airflow. Um, I've been working with Airflow for a long time, since before I worked at Astronomer, and I uh, have taught lots of folks to use it over the years. Um, I think it's a really great tool, and I love sharing it with everybody. So uh, today, I'm going to go through an introduction. Um, we're going to start with some slides just for some background to kind of set the stage, make sure you understand all of the sort of core concepts within Airflow. Uh, and then we'll dive into actually talking about how to run Airflow locally. Um, so you can go ahead and start playing around with it um, and walk through some example DAGs and actually dive into the code a bit. Uh, as Raj said, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I will leave time at the end for Q&A. There's usually lots of questions on this topic. Um, so we wanna get to as many of those as we can. Um, the other thing I will throw out there, um, and I will try and find the link and throw it in the chat because I didn't put it in the slides, but the annual Airflow user survey is happening right now. It is open until June 3rd, so you still have, I think that's probably Friday or something, um, end of this week. So you still have a few days to fill it out. Um, if you have started playing around with Airflow or you're thinking about using it for um, your use case or within your organization, you're not sure, um, about it, uh, definitely fill that out. Uh, if there are things you want to see with Airflow as we go through today, um, or you have questions, that's a great place to kind of make your voice heard. Um, the Airflow community definitely takes that stuff into account. Um, thank you, Varaj, for putting that in the chat. Um, so super important. Again, they take that feedback very seriously. It is used to develop new Airflow features. So we want to hear from you. Um, try and do that this week. Um, Awesome. So with that, I will go ahead and dive in. Um, we can get a clicker on the right screen. Here we go. Um, so to start off, um, Airflow is a really popular tool. As Raj said, the Airflow Summit was last week. Um, hopefully some of you got to join and watch some of the talks. Um, if you're totally new to Airflow, just a super high level um, overview. Um, in short, it's an open source tool for programmatically authoring, scheduling, and monitoring your data pipelines. I was originally created inside of Airbnb. Um, it's now a top level Apache software foundation project. Um, and it's super rapidly growing. Um, Airflow has had a ton of development over the last couple of years, especially in the last year. We're actually gonna touch on some of the really new Airflow features as we go through today. Um, but part of the reason why it's so popular are kind of these core tenants of Airflow. So um, it's super extensible, uh, highly scalable, and and it's an open source tool. It has a really, really large and vibrant community. Uh, I don't even bother to put like the number of GitHub stars and forks and things like that in the slide anymore because it's just too hard to keep up with them or the monthly downloads. Those numbers are really high. Airflow is used all over the world by all sorts of organizations from, you know, really big um, companies all the way down to, you know, single users. So um, super helpful for almost any type of uh, data pipelining and management. And we'll go through some of that today. Um, so part of why it's, you know, so broadly accessible um, is Airflow is kind of built on these core principles. Um, so again, this is just to kind of set the stage on why you might want to use Airflow at a high level um, within your organization. And we'll touch on all of these kind of as we go through the examples so you can see how this works in practice. Um, but some of the really important ones that I like to call out are 
Um, one of the biggest you know, tenets of Airflow is uh, pipelines as code. Um, so everything in Airflow is written in Python code. Um, that is sort of the basis for a lot of these benefits that we mentioned here. So it's super flexible. If you can write it in Python, you can write it in Airflow. Um, that's obviously super powerful. Uh, it's really extensible. It's designed to plug into external systems. We're going to talk about that a lot and how that works. Um, obviously, it's open source, so um, that brings you know the benefit of a um, you know really big community with lots of folks contributing. Also, has the benefit of you can fill out things like the Airflow survey, and those you know comments are taken into account. Or if you want to contribute back, you can do so. Um, so that's a huge benefit there. Um, other things for using Airflow kind of in production uh, with your company that are important, um, we'll touch a little bit on throughout today, but they are kind of deeper topics that have other resources out there, um, things like scalability. Um, so Airflow is built to have super flexible infrastructure um, that you can scale out, um, has sort of integrated security. So if you need RBAC or things like that, it's going to have all of those features. Um, so again, some of this we won't get into uh, in tons of depth today since Airflow is a big topic, so I'll probably say that more than once. Um, there are lots of other additional resources out there as well, though, so if there's something you want to hear more about, definitely throw that in as a question and we can help direct you to kind of what, what is out there that um, you can utilize. Cool. So diving into kind of the core concepts within Airflow, and actually I'm going to start with the core components. Um, again, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, all of them could be sort of topics within themselves, but it's good to know what everything is before we dive into the actual code and data pipeline so that you have some form of reference for what we're talking about. Um, and so Airflow's core components are the pieces that are going to run sort of under the hood um, that are required to you know, make Airflow actually run in your environment. So you may or may not have to actually interact with them directly um, a lot or even at all, um, depending on how Airflow is running in your environment, but it is good to know what they are. And the first three here listed, the web server, the scheduler, and the database are the key three. So whenever you have Airflow running, all three of these services are going to be running. Um, the web server is going to be your Flash server that's serving up the UI. Um, so that's an important piece of Airflow that we'll talk about as we go through. Uh, the scheduler, obviously super important. That's the daemon that's actually responsible for scheduling your jobs. Um, lots is going to go on behind the scenes within the scheduler that as a user, hopefully you don't really have to touch at all, but that's the most important piece. If the scheduler is not running, neither are your jobs. Um, and then you have a database. So that's going to be where all of your metadata are stored. Um, typically, uh, people will use Postgres. Um, that's what we use at Astronomer. There are other options, but you always have to have a database running. And the third three, or I should say the last three here listed here are kind of other components that are separate from those core ones, but are also important. So an executor is also always going to be running within your Airflow instance. That's going to define how the tasks get executed. Um, you have multiple different options for what executor you run um, that will uh, be responsible for um, again, different ways of executing different tasks. And so um, which one you choose, it might be running within your scheduler. Um, it might be running external to your scheduler, just depends. Um, with that, depending on your choice of executor, you may have standing workers, so processes that are going to execute your tasks. Um, that's, again, not necessarily required. It depends on how you decide to set up your Airflow instance. Uh, and then finally, you might have something running called a trigger. So this is going to be a separate process that runs async IO and is going to support deferrable operators. So this is for Airflow version 2.2 and above. Um, again, the trigger uh, is a separate process from your scheduler. It is optional. So if you don't want to use these deferrable operators, um, you don't have to run it. Uh, depending on, again, how you're running Airflow in your environment, it may or may not be run automatically. Um, the option we're going to show today um, will run it automatically. But um, again, something to keep in mind, depending on what you want to do with Airflow. All right, so now we're going to dive into more of the uh, pipeline authoring side. So if you are the data engineer, the data scientist, or the person who's going to write the data pipelines that Airflow is going to run, these are the concepts that um, you will be interacting with all the time. 
And the most high level concept within Airflow is a DAG. Um, so that stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. You think of a, a DAG is just your data pipeline. Um, it's within Airflow. And uh, you can think of it as where a task, so one unit of work that does something is a node in that graph. And the edges in that graph are going to be your dependencies. So the main rules for DAGs are that your tasks uh, and your, your graph of tasks flow in one direction and have no loops. So it's the directed acyclic. Um, so this example here on the left would be something valid where you have some simple dependencies between your four tasks. Um, something on the right would be invalid. So you can't have that loop between T1 and T4. Um, that could create an infinite loop in your code, which is obviously bad. You want to avoid that. So if you tried to do something like that, you will get an error within Airflow. Um, but past those rules, you can define your DAGs in whatever way makes sense for you. Um, they might be simple. They could have a single task. They could have thousands of tasks. Um, and we'll go through sort of some kind of common patterns as we um, move on to some examples in a minute. And then, so drilling down one level deeper, uh, you have tasks. So again, I mentioned just a second ago that tasks are the nodes in your DAG. So you can think of them as like a unit of work. Best practice is to keep those tasks atomic, meaning each task does a single thing. Um, again, you can think of them as they might do something like uh, make an API call or kick off a Databricks job or wait for a file to land in S3. What your tasks do is totally up to you. Um, there are many options for defining them. Um, at the core level, they are defined in Python. So they could be as simple as a Python function that you write and you want to run. Um, when you actually go to run your DAGs, your data pipelines, uh, you'll have something called a task instance. So that's going to represent a specific run of that task. So for a DAG, for a task, for a point in time, that's your task instance. Uh, as you're going through Airflow, both in the logs and in the documentation and things like that, you might see this referred to as TI. That's often how people will alias them. Um, sometimes they're referred to as TI in the Airflow database. Um, so if you see TI, that's task instance. That's what it's talking about there. Um, cool. And then <coughs> next concept within um, that same realm was operators. So operators are like the building blocks of Airflow DAGs. So you can think of them as like a wrapper around each task that defines what that task is going to do. In general, the goal of operators is that they are, uh, they contain a lot of the logic already written for you within Python. So the amount of code that you have to write to actually do the work that you wanna do within that task uh, is often not very much. Um, sometimes it's as simple as providing sort of configuration. Uh, so there's tons of different operators available in Airflow for all sorts of different use cases. We're going to look at some of the more common ones today. Um, just as some examples to give you a sense of what they might do, um, super simple ones that are part of the core of Airflow are things like, again, the Python operator that's going to run a Python function. Um, simple HTTP operator is going to execute an API request. Um, you also have a you know, subset of operators that are called sensors, um, so like the external task sensor. Those are a special type of operator that are going to wait for something to happen. Um, so they will you know, sit there and pull until some external criteria is reached and then move on. So super helpful for making your DAGs sort of event driven um, or things like that. You will also have lots of very specific operators um, often provided by the community to interact with external systems. Um, so there are uh, operators for many of the common um, external systems out there, um, things like Snowflake or Databricks. Um, again, those are going to uh, reduce the amount of code that you have to write. So if you want to run a query in Snowflake or transfer files from S3 to Snowflake, um, there's an operator already written for that, which means you don't have to figure out the Python code for interacting with the API and actually make, running that query and, you know, dealing with um, all of the interactions between Airflow and that other system that's already done for you. You can just use that existing operator. Um, and we're going to talk about sort of how you can figure out what operators uh, exist in just a minute here. Um, that brings me to the next topic, which is providers. Um, so again, with those operators, I said, 
um, said that some of them are part of the core of Airflow, which means if you have Airflow running, you have those available to you. Those tend to be the more standard quote operators of they're just very generic. So they do things like execute a Python function or a bash script or things like that. Providers are going to be for um, all of the relevant modules, so operators, sensors, things like that, that are going to interact with third party services. So that Databricks one that I mentioned, or the Snowflake one, um, all of the big cloud providers, Google, Amazon, Azure, are going to have their own provider packages. These are actually separate Python packages. So you will install them into your Airflow environment, just like you would any other Python package, like from PyPy. Um, the astronomer registry, which I'm going to actually show in a minute here, um, is going to be the best place to go to uh, kind of learn more about those provider packages. But in all likelihood, you will need to use provider packages within your Airflow environment. I would say it's um, maybe there are some use cases where you're only working with like the Python operator, um, but typically you will be interacting with external systems for most use cases. And just to show, kind of highlight again, how this all comes together and how Airflow um, is a really powerful tool. Uh, just like to show this example, sort of implementation of a data flow where there's lots of different systems here um, that are all being orchestrated by Airflow. Uh, so again, this is one of the key strengths of Airflow, again, is that extensibility. Uh, so it's made to interact with those external systems and act as sort of an agnostic orchestrator. Um, so you can implement something really complicated like this with all sorts of different systems and data moving you know, between them with relatively little code and airflow um, using kind of inherent airflow functionality and the provider ecosystem. Um, cool, so from there, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive into some examples. And again, I'm going to start uh, by looking at the astronomer registry. So uh, this is where I would recommend going if you're new to Airflow, you want to figure out, OK, I just talked a whole bunch about operators and provider packages, and I want to find out, like, what can I actually do for my use case? Is there a provider out there? Um, how do I implement that provider within my DAG? Um, the registry is going to be the best one-stop shop um, for you to go to uh, to find that out. So the address here, this is just a um, public website available to everybody. Um, you'll see on the homepage, again, those. Uh, this is where I took that screenshot. So all of the major cloud providers are going to have pages here. If I want to say, look at Amazon's, um, I can come in here and it's going to show me all of the available modules. So any operators, sensors, and there are some other modules that I didn't touch on as much. Um, those are all going to be listed here and uh, along with information about each one. So if I obviously this is one that can be used to create an S3 bucket, it's going to tell me how what the parameters are um, link to any external documentation uh, need it. And uh, also going to provide example DAGs. So um, oops. That one doesn't exist anymore. Uh, let's say I am using Snowflake internally and I want to you know, look that up. Usually I can look up the provider or the modules, um, but I'm going to go to uh, this example, Snowflake DAG. And uh, these DAGs that are on the registry are all curated um, either by astronomer or submitted by the community. Um, and there's sort of, uh, I should say, exemplify best practices and show you how you can actually use these modules within your DAG. So they might be helpful for uh, sort of inspiration for use cases in terms of what you can do with Airflow. Um, they'll also be helpful in just, you know, figuring out how does this operator work? What parameters do I have to pass into it? Um, things like that so that you don't have to uh, kind of look that up yourself. That can be um, pretty time consuming if you have to figure out a lot of them. So this should save you some time there. Um, so all of the code is available there. You can, if you want to, come in and copy this into your own Airflow environment. My dog has lots to say about the Snowflake operator <laughs> um, there with the commentary. Uh, cool. So this is a great place to get started, um, again, to figure out all of the information about those providers. Um, there will also be links out to GitHub if you'd prefer to, you know, interact with the repos there. Um, all of these tags exist on GitHub as well. 
Um, so from there, kind of the natural next question is, okay, I found a DAG that I think I want to get working in my environment. I want to try this. This is analogous to my use case. How do I actually get started with Airflow? And so running Airflow can actually be kind of tricky. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, uh, including, you know, some that are listed on the Airflow website. Today, we're just going to talk about running Airflow locally. So this is great if you are just getting started, you want to go play around with Airflow, um, kind of see how it works. Not ideal for running in production. That's a whole nother kind of conversation. So um, definitely let us know if that's something you want to talk more about, but it's not within the scope of today's webinar. So uh, I'm going to talk about running Airflow locally and over to my terminal here, and I'm going to use Astronomer's uh, Astro CLI to do so. Um, so I run Airflow locally myself uh, many different ways for many different years, and um, definitely this is going to be the easiest way. So Astronomer's Astro CLI is open source. It's available for everybody to use. You can go download it today. Um, once you do that, uh, it's super straightforward. Um, we can maybe throw a link in the chat um, to our, our documentation on how to get that installed. Once you do that, um, just from my terminal here, um, is, oops, I have it uh, alias here is Astro Cloud. This is going to provide also, um, you know, functionality to interact with Astronomer's uh, platform. So that's going to be for Astronomer customers. Um, but again, you can use it just to run Airflow locally. So that's what I'm going to show here. And the flow to do this is once you've created a new directory, so I'm in this intro to Airflow one here, I can go ahead and initialize a Astronomer project. So the command for that is Astro Cloud Dev init. Um, that's going to uh, go ahead and create me a set of files and folders to run Airflow locally within a Dockerized setup. So prerequisites for this, um, you do have to have uh, Docker installed. Uh, you will also want Python installed, not required for the CLI, but obviously required to uh, write your DAGs in Airflow. Um, so uh, once you have all that, again, you can see this file structure that it created here. Um, important pieces of this are my Docker file. So um, if you look at this, this will by default pull one of uh, Astronomer's uh, Airflow images. So again, this, this will vary like depending on how you decide to run Airflow. If you don't use Astronomer CLI, you might be working with one of the open source Airflow images. Um, you can potentially run Airflow not using Docker. Um, you're a little more limited in that sense. It is just a Python package, so you could run kind of truly locally if you wanted to. Um, but this is kind of what you'll see if you're running it, again, within the context of the Astro CLI. Um, from there, to go ahead and get Airflow running locally, I can just do Astro Cloud Dev Start. Um, I've actually already run this in another directory to save us some time. So if I pop over to this one, uh, you can see up here, I ran this. Um, it went through and pulled the image that I want to use um, and went ahead and started up Airflow. So. That means I now have it running. Um, you'll see I have uh, my Airflow web server running at my local host here. And if I do a Docker PS, you should see that I have three containers running here. Uh, again, those are um, uh, one of those correspond to those core Airflow components that I talked about earlier. So I've got a scheduler, um, schedulers here and a web server and a Postgres database. So the nice thing about the um, Astro CLI is that it's gonna do all of that for you. Um, so you don't have to configure everything. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, setting up a database separately and connecting it into Airflow. You can just do those two commands and you're off and running. Um, so uh, from there, we'll do is talk through this file structure a little bit more and then we'll hop over to the uh, UI and actually walk through Airflow in these example DAGs. So again, when I do that Astro Cloud Dev init, uh, besides my Docker file, it creates me a whole structure to work in this Airflow project. This is also really nice. This would not be included if you just ran um, uh, sort of ruled your own uh, Airflow with Docker, you would have to create something like this. 
Um, important pieces are the DAGs folder here. So this is gonna include all of my DAGs. Um, typical pattern is to do one DAG per Python file. Um, we'll walk through the actual structure for defining a DAG, but in this particular case, I have four Python files, four DAGs in my environment. You can get more complex. We're not gonna go into that today, um, but again, that's the typical pattern that I would recommend starting with. Um, you might also have other you know, files and things like that that you need your DAGs to access. You could include all of those within the same project. That's what the include directory is for. The other piece that's important that I'll point out here is this requirements.txt file. So remember those uh, Airflow provider packages are separate Python packages that you need to install into your Airflow environment. Um, you might also need other Python packages that aren't part of Airflow within your DAG. So maybe you're going to work with you know, pandas or you know something like that. Um, you would need to install those in your environment. Uh, if you are working with the CLI, you can simply add those to your requirements.txt file. And then when you do that Astro Cloud Dev start, they'll all get installed for you. Um, so you can see here I have the Snowflake provider installed, so I'm going to use that in my DAGs. Okay, so now if I hop over back to my um, uh, browser here and go to my localhost 8080, uh, you can see I have Airflow running. So this is the Airflow UI. This is looks like what you'll see. Um, if you're running this version of Airflow, we are on the most recent here, um, 2.3. Some of the features I'm going to show in this next DAG are actually specific to 2.3. So uh, word of advice, if you're just starting with Airflow, definitely start with the newest version. There's no reason not to. You'll get all of the latest and greatest features. Um, and again, so remember I had those four DAGs uh, in my DAGs folder, those four Python files. You can see those here. So all four of them are showing up. Um, we're going to start by looking at this example DAG basic. I click into this. Um, first thing I'm going to see is the grid view. Actually, I'm going to look at the graph view first. This is going to show me an overview of the graph of this DAG. Um, this is probably the best way to see, get an overview, quickly um, visual overview of, sort of what's going on within the DAG. So I have three simple tasks here, um, an extract, a transform, and a load. Um, you can see here that each of them are a decorated Python operator. Um, so this view, again, is just going to show me what's going on um, within the stag and what my dependencies are. The grid view, which is new as of Airflow 2.3 and super, super helpful, is going to be for looking at DAG run history. Um, so I'm not going to see those dependencies, but I'm going to get to see what has happened when the stag has actually run. Um, so uh, each of these columns here is a DAG run. Um, you can see my three tasks, extract, transform, load. So each have a row here. Um, each of the squares uh, is a task instance. So remember that's a task for a DAG in a DAG at a point in time. So this is each time this one has run. Um, the bars here are gonna show me, you know, the duration of the DAG. So for some reason, this one, took a lot longer than the rest of them. Not sure what was going on there. Um, this view will also give you, you know, information about, you know, what has happened within the DAG run. Um, you can uh, control the task. So if you want to rerun it or something like that, you can do so here from the UI. Um, this particular one is a lot of green, obviously, but if I did um, have any issues in a task instance, I would be able to um, come here and say, look at the logs for the task. And if I had a failure, this would be a great place to come to see, you know, what, what happened, um, what was the error that I needed to fix. Um, cool. So those are two really helpful views in the UI when you're getting started. Um, let's actually look at the code for this DAG and how you would go over how you would define it. So um, I'm going to go over to the code view. This is going to show me exactly the same thing as the actual code that we looked at in my terminal in that Python file. Um, having the code view in the UI is also really helpful for, you know, maybe you don't have access to the underlying code and you need to see what's going on in the DAG, or I frequently use it to make sure that any updates I made in my uh, code editor are actually reflected here in my DAG um, within my Airflow environment. So this is a great way to look at that. Um, 
And so DAGs are defined pretty simply, again, as just regular Python files. So uh, I'm going to have imports at the top. Um, in this particular example, I'm not actually using any providers. So we'll look at one that, act that does in just a minute. But this one's pretty straightforward, and it's actually going to use Airflow decorators. So because Airflow um, DAGs are written in Python, you have a lot of different options for uh, sort of style and how you want to define your code. So decorators are one way of doing that. That's what this DAG uses. Um, they're not the only way, so you can use uh, we'd say traditional operators as well. We're gonna show both here. Um, so important pieces of this, we're going to instantiate the DAG. Um, so this is what's gonna tell Airflow, this is a this Python file is a DAG file as opposed to maybe like a SQL script that you're gonna call in or something like that. Um, within your DAG, you're gonna provide it, you know, important metadata about how you want that DAG to run. So things like your schedule interval, um, that can be like a cron expression, uh, might be, be a time delta. So this one runs every 30 minutes. Your DAG does not have to have a schedule. You can put none here and it will run only when you tell it to. Um, so lots of flexibility there. Uh, you'll have a start date. So um, when you want that DAG to start running, the date you want to use, you can also have an end date. Um, so you have in general in Airflow full flexibility over when and how that DAG is going to run. Um, really important parameter is catch up. Um, this actually defaults to true, um, which can get people into trouble sometimes. Um, Ketchup is going to tell Airflow, say I have a start date, obviously this one's quite some time ago, 2021, 101. Um, if Ketchup is true, when you turn on this DAG, Airflow will backfill every DAG run that would have happened uh, from that start date up until the current date. Um, so you can imagine if I set this to true, and I go all the way back, you know, a year and a half almost to go uh, every 30 minutes, that's going to be quite a lot of DAG runs that are going to kick off. Um, so again, something to be careful of because catch-up is going to default um, to true, but you can turn it to false and then Airflow will say, okay, I don't need to backfill. Um, okay, and then uh, other things. So there are other, you know, DAG parameters that uh, are available that we're not showing here. Um, tags is another one if you want to, again, add tags to your DAG that will show up in the UI. You have tons of different options for kind of what you put in here, again, to get that finer grain control over um, what's happening when your DAG runs. Okay, so then after that, um, we're going to dive into the actual DAG code itself, so defining our tasks. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So again, in this case, <coughs> dusty in here, <coughs> um, we have, <coughs> we're defining using decorators. And so I'm going to find my DAGs as Python functions <coughs> and tell Airflow that they are tasks just by using this decorator. So, <coughs> sorry, so <laughs> decorators can be a super clean way of, uh, uh, defining your code if you're just writing your own Python function. So as opposed to using like the Python operator. Um, so then within these Python <coughs> functions, again, I can do uh, whatever I want this task to do. So in this case, I'm defining three, this extract, this transform, and this load. Um, each one of them in this case are doing just pretty simple um, <coughs> ordering, you know, creating a a uh, string with some dates, um, uh, printing, you know, something as an example. Uh, again, in your, <laughs> your case, those might be actually managing your data, um, slashing it, they might be making API calls, you know, anything that you want to do in a Python function, you could define there. And then finally, at the end here, I'm going to define my dependencies. So when I'm using decorators like this, uh, dependency definition is as simple as passing those functions um, as uh, uh, dependencies into the one previous. So we'll look at another way of defining dependencies in just a second. There's a lot of different ones that you can do. But again, this is a super clean style for when you're using these decorators. Um, so this is going to tell me that um, this uh, extract data has to come before um, so order data um, is uh, 
an input to my transform data, uh, which is an input to my load data. And then finally, I actually call the DAG function, which is going to tell Airflow, hey, this is a DAG. You need to render it um, and start running based on the parameters that I've defined. Um, so super simple example there. This example DAG actually ships with the uh, CLI. So if you start a project using the Astro CLI, this DAG will show up there. Um, so you can play around with it. You can make changes to it, um, things like that. Uh, so let's go back and look at another example that actually uses some provider packages and interacts with some external systems. So for that, I'm going to look at this mapping ELT. Um, obviously, for this one in the grid view, lots more complication going on here. So you actually get a sense of uh, some colors um, coding for different statuses of my task. You can see lots of failures amongst the successes. Um, these pink ones are tasks that are skipped, uh, so you don't have to run each task every single time your DAG runs. And if you look at the graph view for this DAG, um, this one is doing is uh, kind of an ELT framework for moving files from S3 into Snowflake and then processing them within Snowflake using Snowflake's compute. So what we're going to do here is uh, get a list of files from S3. We're going, then going to load them into Snowflake. Uh, we're then going to run a transformation query within Snowflake. Um, so again, to use um, that sort of end, uh, end service as the compute layer. Um, and then we're going to do some cleanup for, OK, we've processed those files, so we want to move them out of our landing area in S3. Um, the other thing that this DAG does is make use of a new feature within Airflow called dynamic task mapping. Um, so that means uh, I can have you know, multiple copies of this load files to Snowflake task based on how many files I actually have in S3, and that will change, so shrink or expand uh, on each DAG run. So super, super useful feature that was just released uh, about a month ago. Um, that we're really excited about and definitely um, anybody new to Airflow should look into it because it's uh, helpful for a lot of use cases. So again, this DAG is going to interact with a couple of different external systems. Um, you can see in the operator list here, there's a whole bunch of them that we're using. And we're going to look at the actual code for this um, here. So um, you'll notice right away that in the import paths, lots more being imported here, again, because we are using um, those different provider packages uh, for you know, more specific operators. So in this case, we're using the Snowflake provider package and the Amazon provider package to get these operators that are super specific for our use case. Um, I do still use one decorator, so I have one Python function that I wrote myself to get these S3 files, um, as I wanted sort of more fine-grained control uh, on what this task was doing. So again, if you want to do that mixed in with using the actual operators themselves, you totally can. Um, I then define my DAG. Uh, so again, this is a different way of defining a DAG. I'm using the DAG function within Airflow as opposed to the decorator. Both are totally valid. It's just a stylistic preference. Um, so again, here in this case, I give it a DAG ID. Um, and then a lot of the same parameters that you saw me use uh, in the last one. So my start date, catch up, schedule interval. Again, there's a bunch more parameters you have available to you, um, things like this template search path, which is going to tell Airflow, hey, I'm going to call in external files. Um, in this case, it's a SQL file that I have separate that I'm going to run. Um, and I want to put that somewhere other than my DAGs file to keep my project organized. So you can do things like that. And then here I define uh, my operators. So these are more what we call traditional operators as opposed to the decorators. And you'll notice there's not actually a lot of code in here. Um, so this is one. Mostly what you're doing when you're using um, provider operators is uh, defining the configuration. So this operator moves data from S3 to Snowflake. Um, all I'm providing here is kind of the basic you know, meta information. 
Um, so things like the stage that I want to use within Snowflake, the table I'm going to upload to, the schema I'm uploading to, um, things like that. Again, just the configuration. All of the logic for actually taking the file from S3 and loading it into Snowflake is going to happen within that operator. I, as the user, do not have to worry about that. Um, same thing with uh, these other operators here. So this one's going to copy an S3 object. This is what I use to move the file into the processed folder. So I say, this one has been loaded. I don't want it in landing anymore. I'm gonna move it somewhere else. Um, then that one I moved or copied, I'm gonna go ahead and delete it afterwards using this one. Again, all I'm providing is uh, kind of information about how to connect to that service and what the file is that I want to move, but the actual moving of it happens within the operator. Uh, finally, I have the Snowflake operator. So again, all I'm providing is the SQL query that I want to run. I have that in a separate file. That's the best practice to keep that out of your DAG file, just to make it cleaner and easier to read. Um, and then finally here, I define my dependencies. Um, so again, this is a different way of defining them um, when you're using traditional operators, uh, as opposed to uh, the decorators, you would define them using um, something like the bit shift operator here. So this says that copy to Snowflake has to come before both of these uh, tasks, the moved S3 and the transform in Snowflake. Um, one last thing I'll note about this DAG um, is, again, because I'm interacting with external systems, I do have to make a connection to those. So this will be required almost any time you use Airflow with any other system. Uh, you'll notice in each of these operators, uh, I have something called a connection ID. So what that's called depends on the operator. In this one, it's the Snowflake Con ID, and I'm passing a name. In this one, it's the AWS Con ID. Same with these other AWS ones. Um, that's where I provide Airflow with the connection information to authenticate to those external systems. Lots of different ways you can define this or you can set these up. Um, but the most straightforward one we'd recommend for basic users if you're running a DAG like this is to define them within Airflow themselves. So you see for the Snowflake one, I have it this thing called Snowflake. If I go to the admin tab and connections, uh, you'll see I have two defined here, um, S3 and Snowflake. If I were to add a new one, um, you can fill out this form with all the information you need to uh, connect to your system. So if I were to do another Snowflake one, I would choose Snowflake um, and I provide it with all of this information. So my Snowflake host and schema, login, password, things like that. So that's how Airflow is going to um, actually be able to interact with those external systems. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left. It was kind of a whirlwind tour of a couple of DAGs, but I wanna leave time for uh, any questions anything that we've covered so far. Yeah, that was awesome. I didn't see the new examples part of this yet, so I'm glad it, I'm really, it's really glad you took a new feature and roped it into an intro course. Um, the Q&A has been pretty busy with questions, and I think so far I've gotten to most of them, uh, but if anybody wants some more information, feel free to drop it in the chat or the Q&A section. Cool. I'm going to interpolate a question real quick. Can you go through what ketchup is one more time? Yeah, for sure. Um, so let me look at what this DAG has in it. Okay, so um, when you start, when you add a new DAG into your Airflow environment, this is a good example of this static ELT, um, it's going to default into this paused um, status. So it's there. Airflow has seen the DAG, but it's not turned on. So Airflow is not actually going to run the DAG until you flip the switch and say, I want to unpause quote my DAG. I want to turn it on and then it's going to run. With this DAG, we can see that in the UI that the schedule is daily. Um, so it's going to run every day. If I look at the code for it, uh, the start date is uh, April 2nd of this year. So if I were to flip this DAG on now and my catch up parameter was true, 
or I didn't define it because it defaults to true, Airflow is going to say, okay, today is May 31st. This DAG started on April 2nd and it runs daily. I need to backfill, so fill in all of those DAG runs that I've missed. So it's going to start with a run on April 2nd and it's going to run that one. It's going to run April 3rd, 4th, all the way up to May 31st today. Um, so it's going to catch up on all of those DAG runs it would have missed from your start date up until the current date based on your schedule. Um, that can be really useful. Sometimes you need that, especially if you're doing things like processing data and you say, uh, I actually needed to process the data starting last week or last year or whatever. So you might want to turn that on. Um, if you don't want to turn it on, so for whatever reason, your DAG has a start date in the past, but uh, I don't want it to run, you know, all of those runs from last month until this month, or in my other example where it was scheduled every 30 minutes, but the start date was a year and a half ago. I don't want it to kick off, you know, 2000 DAG runs. Um, you can set this catch up parameter equal to false, and then Airflow will start scheduling at the next run. Um, so it won't do anything in the past. It will just say, when is the next time this DAG is supposed to run? And it'll pick up there. Awesome. Thanks for that, Captain. Another question from Cohen Rod is, could you just go through the difference between the trigger and sensors one more time? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's actually a lot of nuance there. So in general, the difference is the trigger is a process that's running as part of your airflow infrastructure. So kind of analogous to the scheduler, where in my case, running here in a Docker I set up, I would have like a separate Docker container for the trigger, and it's going to manage processes within airflow. So as the user, you're not actually interacting with the trigger. It's something running that's going to work for you. Um, it's specific to right now deferrable operators, which we didn't touch on um, today. Those are more of an advanced concept, but uh, deferrable operators work in a different way. And so they need this separate process to manage them. So that's what the trigger is. A sensor is a special type of operator that you would use in your DAG um, that's going to wait for something to happen. So if I look for like the external task sensor here. Let's see if we have an example DAG. Um, external task sensor is an example. So what this sensor will do is wait for some other task within Airflow to finish. And what those can be used to do is say, um, I want to only run this DAG or this part of my DAG after something external has occurred. So I need to wait for something to happen. So you build the sensor into your DAG so that it just sits there running um, until that criteria is met. And then it says, okay, now move on with the rest of my DAG. So if you were to um, implement this in your code, you would see just something like this, where it looks just like another operator. Um, it's just called a sensor and it does function slightly differently. So, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. That was awesome. You can answer that much better than I did in the chat. <laughs> so. Kind of a hard one to type out. <laughs> Lots of new ones there. Awesome. Um, so this is a little off topic, but I think it's a good question, especially from the uh, last webinar about dynamic task mapping. Um, so can you just talk about how you can use dynamic tasks to do something like um, read an API and write that data into BigQuery? Yeah. Um, in that case, okay, I'm going to interpret that as maybe you have data coming from multiple APIs and you want to write them all in BigQuery. Um, okay. Yeah. Good question. So with dynamic task mapping, um, what that feature allows you to do is to implement um, sort of tasks that change at runtime within your DAG. So if we look at like this example DAG, is static quote in that every single time I run it, it's going to run these three tasks one after the other. Nothing, no external criteria is going to impact what this DAG does. Um, dynamic task mapping, on the other hand, is going to allow you to 
say, I have some external criteria that I need to determine what my tasks do based on that criteria. And so this DAG, this mapping ELT actually implements this. So if I look at the graph view, you'll notice on this load files to Snowflake task, there are these brackets after words. Um, that indicates to me that this is a dynamic task. And so in this particular case, how we've set this up is I'm going to get my S3 files for each file that lands. I want to load that into Snowflake and I want those to be separate tasks. So lots of benefits to designing it that way. And then if I have three files in S3, this will end up being three different tasks. If I have a hundred, it'll end up being a hundred different tasks and it'll update every single time at runtime. So you could do something very similar uh, with that use case where this task say would be um, get your, well, I guess if it were multiple APIs, you would, you know, get your list of APIs that you need to query from. And <laughs> so that might be like a Python function that you write yourself or depending on where they're coming from, um, might be, you know, wherever you need to get that information from. Um, you would then map based on that to have a single task that grabbed data from those APIs. Um, so that might be using like the HTTP operator, um, might be you writing your own Python function. It kind of depends on how the API works. And then downstream from that, you would go ahead and say, okay, load all those files into BigQuery or something like that. Um, in terms of the code for, uh, uh, applying dynamic task mapping. It's super straightforward. Um, uh, this is the one that we do it on here. So um, the key function is this expand. Um, so that's going to tell Airflow this parameter. So in this case, it's the S3 keys. I want to map on that. So for every S3 key, create me a new task. Um, the partial one is going to pass in anything that's going to stay the same. So parameters that you want to be constant for all of the different tasks. Um, but that will create parallel copies of whatever operator this is. So depending on kind of how that use case worked, you might do that on the API side um, with like an HTTP operator or a Python operator. Um, or depending, you might do it on the big query side. So the one that actually loads the data in. Um, just depends how you want to implement that. Bruno, if you want some more help with that use case, feel free to shoot us a note as well. We'd be more than happy to dive in with you. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All righty. I think those are all the questions that we have time for today. Um, like we said, the recording as well as the great code that we went through will be in your inbox uh, in a couple of days. Thank you all so much for joining, and we hope to see you next time. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.